You're listening to Rhett Read Podcast. I'm Anna. I'm Serge. And we're here to talk about books we've read. Hope you enjoy! Hey there! Hey! What's up, Anna? Ready to start this uh, second episode of the Rhett Read Podcast. Well, I'm ready if you are. Let's go. Okay. So, uh, before we start talking about The New Girl by R.L. Stein, did you read any other books this week? Um, this week I have been pecking away at a Myths and Legends book from Central America and Mexico, and I'll probably be working on that for the next two months or three months or however long. How about you? Oh, uh, well, I'm interested in this mythology book, but I guess you're going to tell us more when you finish. I guess so, yeah. Right now, you know, I just got into the introductory chapters, but I know you read a couple books this week, as per your usual, you know. Yes, well, I finished an arc I got. It's an advanced reader copy of Point of No Return, and I want to thank NetGalley and the publisher for that. Uh, Point of No Return is by Martha Gellhorn. It was the arc of the digital edition, actually. The original book was published in 1948 under a different title, which Martha Gellhorn didn't even want it published as that. Mm. And then in 1988, she had the book republished under point of no return the reason the publisher didn't want it as point of no return in 1948 was because they thought the term was just too depressing they said no one wanted to read a book called point of no return and just choose something else and they gave her like a bible and they're like pick something from the bible it was called like wine of anticipation or something like that and she was just like well i didn't get the title i want so i don't really give a shit anymore but then later she was like you know what i looked it up and there were a ton of other books published under point of no return and you know what screw the publisher don't let the publisher push you around ever again and I published, republished the book in 1988 under Point of a Return. On December 20th of 2016, the digital edition of the book was released. I wonder if that's uh, something that happened more often back then than it does today. Because I know um, that one science fiction book I read called The Star's My Destination by an author whose name escapes me. He originally wanted to call it Tiger Tiger, and it ended up coming out as uh, The Star's My Destination. Uh, I mean, understandably... Because Tiger Tiger is not the best name, but like you know, nowadays is that is that also common where the author gets overridden by the publisher and they tell him, you know what, your book title idea is stupid. Probably. Okay. It's one of those what sells things. I guess. Right. They know better, right? Well, publisher knows best. Supposedly. Yeah. No, I mean I know movies go through the same thing for sure. So why not books? Right. And I'm sure like a lot of the movie directors have more power. And if their movie titles get jerked around with, I'm sure the book titles would too. Yeah, it was a it was a good book. I enjoyed it. You don't see many World War II books written by a female author, which I appreciated in the sense that the female characters, they weren't the weird, I guess, waifish sort of servitile stereotypes that you get from books written by male authors in the 1940s. Right. Uh, I read Eric Maria Remark's A Time to Love and a Time to Die, I think it's called. That had a female character in a romance, and I remember thinking the female character was written in a very almost regressive way. But what was interesting in this book was that because... You know, it changes perspectives within scenes. You get the male character's view of things and his opinion of the woman it tends to be sort of low, but then it switches to the female's perspective mm-hmm. and she has like inner thoughts and opinions. And it's like, wow, <gasps> yeah, <laughs> amazing. But that was kind of cool. I think there's some backstory of Martha Gellhorn that needs to be given, you know, in the terms of what gives her the right to write a book about this, where I feel like there's a lot of ownership from a lot of authors who you know because they were in the battle they were there and people were thinking well it's a female author you know there were the wax you know the women army corps Mm -hmm. so martha gilhorn was she was a journalist and she had to hide in a hospital ship that went to normandy for d-day because she couldn't get the press credentials to go there and then she decided that she wanted to cover this war So she basically had to hide from Americans because otherwise she'd get sent back to the U.S. So she just went from regiment to regiment, saw all the fronts of war. Yeah, no, and I know you mentioned to me that, uh, you know, the first two acts of the book were, you know, maybe so-so, but what really elevated it was the final and third act. Right, so the third act talks about one of the characters basically visits uh, the concentration camp Dachau. 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 After, a week after it's liberated. And what's interesting is that 
Martha Gellhorn was actually there the week after his liberated and she heard about the uh, ceasefire while at Dachau and it, her experience there was so profound and it scarred her so deeply that she had to write a book to try to expunge it from her mind and it really shows and it's really horrifying and it just disturbed me greatly as it should right but I would recommend this book I enjoyed it she's very weird writing style if not anything just read for the third act speaking of things that it might go whack in the night maybe right. um, so another book that i finished this week i've been reading it for a while it's a book of short stories called the night shift by stephen king because it's a book of short stories i read a few stories and then take a break and then come back to it and i just finished it it was really interesting because last week we did joe hill's book the fireman and we were yep. comparing him to his dad maybe i need to read joe hill's short stories because he can't be compared to his dad these were great stories um and when did this book come out originally well the last short story was published in 1977 okay. so i think this anthology maybe was put together either in the 1970s late 70s or in the 80s okay so this is some of his earlier work yes okay you know i i know that we, while you were reading this book every couple days or so i would say hey have you read the actual children of the corn yet and you would say no not yet so were they saving the best for last is children of the corn the best story in the entire anthology children of the corn was not the last story in the anthology it was maybe third or fourth the last okay but the speed you read might um, as well have been right yes it was a creepy story it did send chills i thought it was evocative yeah it was one of the scarier stories in the book if you had to if you had to rank it at a scale of um one to ten where five is the new girl by rl stein how scary <laughs> well i mean obviously the new girl is the greatest book of all time and no one compared to rl stein i think if you were to put it on a scale of 1 to 10, Children of the Corn would probably be, in of all the stories in this book, I'd say 8 out of 10, 9 out of 10. Okay. There were some really great stories. And the thing is, they weren't, they were horror in its different ways. So one of the stories is about a man watching his mother die of cancer and possibly assisted suicide for her. And that's not what we would generally think of as horror. But if you actually think about it, that's pretty horrifying. Right. The thought of it. Yeah. There was one about cars and trucks taking over the world. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we debated that one for a while because my take on it, so again, I haven't read it, but my take on it was, well, why don't you just, you know, run away from the road and you will be safe? And then Anna was like, well, you know, the cars have the bulldozers. And, and there they'll are a lot come of off-road vehicles. Right, so the bulldozers will come. They'll, they'll bulldoze the trees. They'll bulldoze the buildings. Whatever you're hiding under, they're going to get you. But then the fatal flaw is they can't pump their own gas. Right, the whole thing was they would kill people in force. It's an allegory of how humans have become slaves to cars and, and sure yeah no obviously this is true um i myself am a slave to my own car it just happened recently folks and it's true if it can happen to me it can happen to you we're gonna take a short break and then we're gonna talk about the new girl So now we're talking about The New Girl by R.L. Stein. Which is the first book in the Fear Street series. This is us finally getting into the meat of this podcast. Uh, this is the moment you guys have all been waiting for. Uh, me getting back into the uh, the childhood that I never had. Congratulations. Uh, thank you so much. Did you feel like a little kid reading these books? I, I did. You know what? I felt like I was back in high school. Obviously, I was not in high school in the 90s. The plot is pretty simple. The plot of the book is Kid Corey. He sees this girl is new girl in school pale blonde hair she wears dresses looks old-fashioned and this, this instantaneous attraction somehow it seems that people don't see her or people don't notice her and only his best friend who's her, also his next door neighbor that like, knows her name and it's anna Crowley. he tries to find her calls her house and every time he calls her house family members go anna's dead anna is dead stop calling anna is dead and they sound really upset they're very upset so he's in love with a ghost possibly and he doesn't know how to deal with that Right, and so the book is him trying to deal with that but failing. He can't deal with it. It actually ends up ruining his life, basically. his It, it affects life. his affects his social life academic it, life academic life athletic and life. and athletics you know he's into gymnastics and when i see he's into gymnastics he's the star of the school gymnastics team and he is failing hard at gymnastics meets because he cannot get this girl off his mind so we're gonna go into spoilers here here so spoiler alert spoilers galore yeah we're assuming if you're listening to this podcast either a you're not gonna read this book anyway 
anyway, or B, you've already read it and you want to see our reaction to it. It spoils, the book spoils itself in the prologue. Yes, the prologue is, this is exactly what we talked about in the previous episode. When I had an issue with Joe Hill's foreshadowing in The Fireman, well, this book, the foreshadowing is not as over the head as it was as Joe Hill. Actually, surprisingly enough, R.L. Stein does foreshadowing a little bit more subtly than Joe Hill, but it's... How is it subtle when you give away well, the it, twist in the first it's, page? It's subtle in the sense that it doesn't actually shout out and say, hey guys, this is foreshadowing. I guess so. Right? right? Because that's what Joe Hill does. He says like, but she would never see him again. Alack, alas, she wouldn't get to say that thing she wanted to say because she, you know. So instead we get a prologue that if you pay attention, you read it carefully, none of the rest of the book is as scary as it could have been otherwise. It really takes away some of that fear factor. And the reason is because you immediately begin to suspect Anna that maybe she's not what she seems she is. Now, considering pro- Anna is killed in the prologue. Right. Yes. Exactly. So you already know she's dead. And then so when her family says she's dead, you you know they're not lying. So something else must be going on. You also know this that, yes, from Corey's standpoint, she seems kind of ghostly. Everyone's like, I'm not sure I saw her. Who are you talking about? You know, those are all very circumstantial things. They actually didn't see her in that particular moment because they weren't paying attention. They were doing something else. At other times, all sorts of people see her. His best friend from childhood, the beautiful girl next door who looks like a famous actress. She looks like Cher. Right, a singer. So she knows all about Anna. She's in her physics class. She's obviously not a ghost, but there are some things that are really causing him to doubt whether or not she's, and that could be because he's a little bit simple-minded. He is so simple-minded and oblivious, and yeah. it was... Oh, oblivious. Am I right? Like, think about the, the Lisa character and him. He is completely oblivious to her, and maybe that's because they grew up together and he's known her since they were like toddlers or whatever, and he just doesn't see her that way, but like, come on. It's like that Taylor Swift song. Yeah, it's exactly exactly like the Taylor Swift song. I had issues with that part as well. Um, I think my main issue for that was you know that nice guy stereotype? Right. I feel like she's the nice girl where she's been friends with him and he this guy is clearly simple. She should know that he's like a simple, absent-minded oblivious guy. Right. And her subtle little, even her not so subtle hints to be honest were just being ignored and she just needed to just straight up say hey listen, I like you instead of getting passive aggressive and upset. Or you know, maybe she didn't want to ruin her friendship she was already ruining her friendship by being really angry towards him no, uh, all the time. Yeah, you know what? But she wasn't because if you read it the way I read it, for example, at the school dance, yeah, she was she was being like kind of mean to him. He wanted to dance and have a good time. He was actually showing her a good time, even though he wasn't actually interested in dating her at that time. He was being, you know, he was actually being a gentleman, in my opinion. You know, she was very upset because of that um, rivalry between her and Anna. He's completely obsessed with Anna and, and, and she feels a little bit jealous. And so she makes a big scene and you know what? He's very understanding. He's like, oh, you know, that's just Lisa. That's how she always is. She's very hot-headed. That's how he knows her. Like, I don't think she was really affecting their friendship that much by doing that because he was already... It was basically affecting their friendship in a way that he wouldn't notice, but it was affecting her more and more because she would be treating him more differently down the line if things didn't turn out the way they did. If Anna was actually like a normal girl oh. who he was in love with... And Not a psycho it, killer? Right. Oh. Then she would be doing something to their friendship which would just be ending it yes. in a way that can't be fixed. And I thought that's just a very it was a very teenage way of doing that. It's a very immature way of doing that. I mean, Well, teenagers do tend to be. I mean, but he was, at, at that point in the dance, he was kind of dismissing the fact that she got a dead cat that was disemboweled, because shoved in her locker. As far as he was concerned, all the evidence pointed toward Anna's brother being the culprit. And he had a lot of reasons to believe that Anna's brother was crazy. Anna's brother... He did come off a little crazy. Anna's brother was coming off really crazy he didn't need to be that crazy but brad to me was basically the weirdo brother character he's much older than kids he's like a 20 something and, and he's described he's always described as watery eyed puffy cheek puffy cheek just like rhinestone earring yeah exactly so he's just like this weirdo older brother character kind of like you know freak that, that's kind of like the stereotype that they were going towards Corey had no reason to to trust the guy and brad gave him no reason to do so brad came up with a cockamamie scheme to keep anna from from getting to him. 
So basically, the backstory is Anna is dead. The person posing as Anna is Willa, Anna's sister. Willa killed Anna because she was so jealous of Anna. Brad hasn't been able to prove that Willa killed Anna and he doesn't want to like hurt his mom. So he's decided that he will be the keeper of Willa. He's gonna make sure that Willa doesn't go off the boat and try to keep the family together. But once they move to Fear Street, she starts assuming Anna's identity in school and Brad realizes that there will be nothing but trouble and that Willa will do something awful to Corey. So he wants to keep Corey safe by being a psychopath. Or he could have just easily said, listen, I realize that my sister Willa is pretending to be Anna and this is what happened and we need to keep you safe. Instead, he was just really creepy. Yeah, and basically that's what we get with the prologue. The, the scene where Willa kills Anna and you get Willa's inner monologue. This is actually the only point in the book where you get it from a perspective other than Corey. So Corey is basically, the, the entire book is written from Corey's perspective except for the prologue. The prologue is written from Willa's perspective. She is just crazy. She's just wallowing in this sensation. This She's ecstatic. She's looking at her sister's dead body and, and going like, well, you are so perfect now, but look how broken and bloody you are. You wouldn't like the blood there. It's a mess on your clothing. Ha ha ha. You're yeah. dead. Oh man. That, that, and again, he does accomplish a little bit of a fear factor there because geez, he, she really comes off as crazy insane. And so, and then it just launches into Corey from that point. And you know, Corey's just a regular high school guy. You know, he strikes me as the kind of guy that wasn't really into dating that much. Well, I, that's my, that was one of my big problems with this book was there was nothing to their relationship. He was just instantly attracted to her. Yeah. Had some wet dreams I, that weren't wet. No, he, oh, the book got really sexy at some points. Like, really? Yeah, no, there's like some really like ridiculous kissing makeout scenes that were just like. And she was sucking his face real hard. Yeah, it was yeah. pretty nuts. But basically what I think what happened here is that this is like his first love. His first lust. Well, yeah, he, I don't, I'm not even sure he's dated before. He, this is the kind of guy, he's been focused on his sport. He's been focused on his schoolwork. He's just a straight shooter sort of guy. He kids around with his friends and they like, you know, joke about girls or whatever but at the end of the day he doesn't have a girlfriend at the start of the book it doesn't seem like he's interested in dating whatsoever but then he sees this white apparition she's so pale she's described as very pale a lot i don't know well that's how you get the uh make people think that she's a ghost right? yeah i guess that's the whole thing right like she's so blonde and pale and like the eyes are like very blue and whatnot and so yeah it's kind of ghostly he thinks she's very beautiful and he instantly falls in love and it kind of just ruins his life from that point on from the very beginning his friend Lee Lisa, who's the girl next door, and David, who's... His best friend from gymnastics. Yeah. They, they got his back. Lisa lends him her t-shirt right away when his shirt is all spoiled with ketchup and tomato sauce and whatever. She lends him a t-shirt. She helps him figure out how to wash his hair before he goes to class. She's always there for him. He feels down and she's there to He helps help her him uh, research more about Anna Crawley. Exactly, yeah. She's uh, the editor for the Shady Side school newspaper. Right. She uh, knows how to use microfilm machines and goes through old newspapers to like research what happened to Anna Crowley who used to live in another town. And David is a good friend at heart. He's your regular jock and Lisa has some problems with him and how he maybe jokes a little bit too much about girls and whatnot. But at the end of the day when he notices that Corey is changing and Corey is losing focus and totally spaced out he's there for him. He calls him up just to talk and be like hey man are you okay? Do you need anything? Out of the blue. That's the sign of a true friend. You're just sitting around doing your homework like hey you get a phone call and you just chat with your friend that's that's pretty legit back in the 90s when i'd get a phone call on the landline from one of my friends like whoa that's a real friend right there well speaking of the 90s yeah. how many things were well this is a 90s moment did you have <laughs> oh yeah no that that happened a lot there was you know obviously the microfilm we would just google this stuff nowadays you don't have to go to the library and look up stuff on microfilm all the landline phone conversations did you like when he called the operator to yeah. get anna's uh, phone number yeah exactly and the operator was like well you know what i can give you the phone number but i can't give you the address it's against the rules and he's like but i'm Please? a nice guy right? you're right exactly and the operator's like oh what the heck it's my last day on the job anyway <laughs> and the funniest thing was like later on somebody calls him and he's like really creeped out like how'd they get my number what if they know my address <laughs> it's like dude they probably just called the operator like you did there was a moment where he's sitting in bed listening to his walkman headphones yeah and i just thought 
kids know what Walkman headphones are. Um, kids, they're kind of like earbuds, but bigger. And a Walkman is like an iPod. Wait, do they even know what an iPod is I these days? I don't think so. <laughs> I think we're old. Oh, man. It's like, a, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a portable tape player. Do they know what a tape is? It's a music thing. Yeah. Um, also, he works in the school office and he had to do ditto papers. Oh, yeah. So actually, no, this is the thing. So dittos actually are still used in school today. Really? Yeah, this is not even a 90s thing. This is the funniest thing. Schools, and there was a cool part in there where he wonders to himself, why are schools still using ditto machines when nobody else is? And this is 1989, mind you. Here where we live, schools are still using ditto machines to this day, and this is 2017. I think there is a scam of some sort where the ditto corporation... Ditto Industries. Ditto Industries International is some dittoing all the school districts, if you know what I mean. Yeah, something's going on there, but that was that was an interesting 90s slash OMG present day moment. Yeah, mostly old landlines. Yeah, I mean, I was thinking of how they interact with each other. Nowadays, you just text each other. He'd probably try to like Facebook stalk her, try to find her like social media presence, Instagram, Twitter. Yeah, but you know what the interesting flip side of that was? When he just needs someone to talk to, he just goes and visits his uh, friend next door, who's a girl, and they sit on the couch together and eat potato chips. Nowadays, he would just, whatever, chat her up on, uh, on his favorite, you know, instant messaging service i think they would still have him go next door and chat with her in real life i think that's the kind of friendship they had maybe but i, I think know. maybe david would be like chatting him via gchat like hey dude would they even use gchat would they be snapchatting i don't know Whatever. what they're doing but the point is the lack of social media is pretty uh, obvious another big 90s thing are the parents which you see in all the 90s kids books where the parents are just they sort of exist but they are really a part of their child's life like i like how his friend called him and went hey are you okay his parents probably noticed the same things and just go hey kid yeah the parents were not doing a great job parenting this kid was sneaking off into a very dangerous part of town on multiple occasions and they should really have shut that down this is the weird thing fear street is a very dangerous part of town if you pay attention during this book there are multiple news reports at one point he picks up a newspaper and happens to glance at a story and then he's also thinking back to himself to multiple news reports he's heard of plus the usual urban legends one hears growing up during childhood about all the stuff that goes on in Fear Street and this Fear Street place does not seem like a safe place to go especially not at night. What would you think the property values are in Fear Street? They are such that there's probably just a bunch of drug addicts living there thinking like crack houses basically. I mean it's not not a safe place just based on the property values alone. There's a burnt out mansion in the corner nobody wants to buy it. There's a cemetery. Cemetery. I mean those things alone probably aren't that big of a deal but like all the deaths yeah, unexplained deaths day in, day out. It's crazy. What I liked was Anna's family's address is 444 Fear Street. Right. And uh, in China, you know, the number four is just like an awful number because the number four si, sounds like si, which means die. So the fact that it's just 444, four, four, just well, die, die, well, die. Well, you know, the number four is fear in German. Oh, that's interesting. So it's fear, 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 fear Street. That's interesting. Yeah. Fun fact for you German speakers out there. Or Mandarin. Right. There you go. Oh, it's not really a fun fact for the <laughs> they already language. caught they caught on to that already all right there you go yeah so interesting so there's another character we forgot to mention is arnie arnie is your typical friend too he exists he exists he's friend too he's goofy he gets one bit of exposition where you're told that he's just one of those guys that just like stumbles through life happy go lucky whatever then a really interesting character this guy we never get his real name i'm gonna call him mr fear street and he has a dog named voltaire and I think... He's going to come back in other books? Yes, I think so too. Right. You don't get much background except that he lives there. He lives on he Fear Street. he will obviously show up in other books because why introduce a random character like this? Exactly. And he is even referred to by Corey as the guardian of Fear Street. Or actually, plural, guardians of Fear Street, him and his dog. Well, he gets attacked by the dog. Yeah, exactly. And so, you know, those two are always coming as a package in this book. They appear like three or four times. You definitely get the sense. Voltaire wasn't there the first time they ran into each other. Oh, but you heard him howling, maybe. There was that strange howling sound. Yeah, that's true. And he's like, is that a wolf? I don't know. I mean, dogs aren't supposed to howl, but 
they make a very similar noise to howling if they want to. And, you know, some high school kid wouldn't know the difference. Mr. Fear Street had to say, like, oh, yeah, you know, Voltaire doesn't like strangers, so I had to, like, tie him up. That could have been what happened. I think, uh, yeah, I think we're going to see these characters again. I don't think we're going to see Brad or Lisa or Hori or any of these people ever again. I think you might. Really? Yeah. Okay. Hori and Lisa, for sure, because they go to the school. They might, I don't think they'll be main characters, but they'll mm-hmm. definitely be a, oh, hey, as Julia walked by Corey and Lisa in the hallway. Yeah, something. one thing one thing I have to say, though, is Corey never sees anything paranormal. The only thing, I, I guess the only thing was that one time where he talks to Anna and then Willa denies that that was her. Do you recall that incident? I mean, but she's... Uh... An unreliable she's character. she's unreliable but there is an off chance that he may have actually spoken with the ghost of anna at one point but that was it that's the only thing and like obviously it's like on the faintest of threads of evidence that that hangs and everything else is completely reasonably explainable nothing out of the ordinary happens in this book that is not explained i mean the, the one incident up. incident that happened on fear street that cory mentions is sort of weird oh right the car the car yeah and again he doesn't see it happen that's true so Right, so what Anna's referring to is, again, throughout the book, you get these sprinkles of reported incidents from Fear Street, and some of them are supposed to be from, you know, reliable news media, like the local newspaper, or like the local television news. Supposedly, weird stuff happens on Fear Street, but we don't know. This could be like the new Scooby-Doo show. What's it called? Scooby-Doo... Uh... Mystery Incorporated? Mystery Incorporated, exactly. They see a lot of weird stuff, but it's actually like a cover-up by that weird corporation oh, yeah. to try to... Exactly. So, for all we know, Fear Street Street maybe has like a very valuable deposit of unobtainium you know deep underneath that neighborhood and evil corporation is just publishing all this fake news to get the residents to sell and get out of there so they can build a giant like mountaintop removal mine and like dig that stuff out of the ground you know they're gonna be really surprised when the guardians of fear street show up and like blow up all their giant robots with bows and arrows and flying birds and stuff <laughs> Right? <laughs> you like your story might be better than what we see. Right. So anyway. So would you uh, would you ever want to live on Fear Street? Would I want to live on Fear Street? No, because I would have um, a hell of a time trying to sell my house. It doesn't seem like a nice place. Uh, the burned out house. The the, the nosy the, neighbor. The rest of the homes are described as old Victorian like. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. So bad wiring, faulty plumbing. This is just like money pit, right? That's true. Exactly. It's a great movie with Tom Hanks, by the way. Yeah. So if you guys want to know what living on Fear Street is like watch money pit with tom hanks there's not that much murder in money pit though. no but you'll get an idea of what it would be like to move into one of those fancy victorian homes um i think we've pretty much covered well, everything what did you think of the book you know what okay so the book was okay i thought the plot moved really well i didn't get bored at any point i i kept on reading even though i saw exactly where it was going it still kept me interested enough to turn the pages i wasn't just doing it for the podcast i was just like okay yeah i'm gonna i'm gonna keep reading i think if if I was a teenager growing up in the 90s, would I read this? Absolutely. Would I like it? Probably. A couple things. Some of the characters were not that relatable. Corey was, quote unquote, a jock. He's a nice guy, but he's very much into the sports and he's not into anything else. And there's nothing wrong with that. That's fine. But that's not who I was growing up. That's not who a lot of kids reading a lot of books were back then, you know. He's described as not the kind of guy that reads a lot. Oh, the Star Trek scene? You remember that? Yeah. And so, yeah, going into that. So, yeah, going into that jock versus non-jock divide he really doesn't like star trek no reason given he just kind of dismisses it and lisa agrees like oh yeah no i don't like it either it was just the last movie that was available at the rental place that's a 90s thing too we missed yeah exactly yeah blockbuster rentals i don't miss it i got some nostalgia but our public library is very good with movies so we don't actually need yeah but i'll tell you what though versus the public library the blockbuster place actually it might have been a hollywood video where i was growing up they let me check out r-rated movies even though it was only like 12 or 13 or something they didn't care the library would never let you do that so you know shout out to uh the local uh video rental you guys are the best anyway kind of not that relatable and then lisa I really Lisa was my favorite character in this book right up until she finds a dead cat in her locker a disemboweled cat. disemboweled cat blood everywhere and in blood written a death threat you will die you will you, you are dead you are dead terrible terrible situation to find yourself in and the way she consoled herself is well good thing I don't like cats <laughs> it's like wow I mean there's one thing is not liking cats and another thing is like going like well I don't care that this cat is dead and disemboweled because 
I really don't like that. See, the thing that struck me about that scene was that they had to clean it up themselves. Right. Corey and Lisa had to clean up. Wouldn't the normal thing to be telling the school there's a dead cat in and my And a death threat. And a death threat. The, the dead cat is one thing, but the death threat plus the dead cat is like, tell the principal right now. Get it on somebody's permanent record. Well, they were talking about permanent records in this book. Oh my God. The permanent record thing was hilarious. At one point, there's this Mission Impossible scene where Corey has to sneak into the principal office and go through the permanent record files and he goes in his whole monologue like internal monologue about how the permanent record is gonna affect your life from now until forever and this is like you got detention for cutting class but somehow this is your permanent record and it will affect your life forever and ever until the day you die <laughs> So one plot hole I found in that yeah. permanent record scene is, shouldn't Willa be registered in that school? Right, and it went by last name. Right. Yeah, that's interesting. But then they also had an explanation for that. They said, you know, maybe the records hadn't gotten transferred yet from the other school. But I know when we moved to a new district, we had to go to the school with our records. Oh, that's true. I had to do that. I so that doesn't do make that. sense. They're not going to let you in without your previous records because yeah. otherwise they don't know what classes to put you in. Right. Yeah, no, that's true. Or they would make a record for you because they're not going to have a non-registered student in their school. Maybe she changed her name. You know, the, the father left the family. Maybe she took her mother's maiden name. That's interesting. Yep. Yeah. Wow. Huh. I just came up with that. How do you like that? Good job. <laughs> Glad you're a RL stan. Oh. oh. No, but by the way, good on the father for leaving that family. <laughs> I'm serious. He, he, got, he got out just in time. <laughs> Honestly, no, he would have been dead. The, the brother is a complete freak. The, the the daughter's a psycho killer. The mom is Had a breakdown. not all there. And Anna sounded like not a great person. She was described, at the end of the book, she was described as having been very full of herself about, you know, how beautiful and whatever she was and successful and all that stuff. And so... Which the th she rubbed it in. She rubbed it in, all yeah. All the time. That's not, what drove Willa to... Not, but that's not an excuse No, okay, her. if... Hold on a second. If you are such an awful person, you drive somebody else to become a psycho killer. How bad are you? She must have been one of those bullies. Might have been a bully, or yeah. Willow was just mentally unstable. Yeah. Anyway, the whole family not great, and then they make the awesome decision of moving to Fear Street. Yeah, that was. A... But you know, probably they didn't have a lot of money. That's probably all they could afford at that point. With property values being so low. Exactly. That's. It's actually a tragedy. The whole thing that happened. They couldn't move into the nice neighborhood of Northwoods or whatever the subdivision was called. There was some very elitist descriptions there that went into like the neighborhood that Corey lived in. Like, oh yeah, the, the well manicured lawns and the houses set back far from the street and the ranch style shingled roofs, whatever. It's like, okay, we get it. It's a white suburban neighborhood. Thanks. Yeah, that's what most of these books tend to be, right? Yeah. Well, no, they, you know, they have to go across the railroad tracks to go to Fear Street and get their, their rocks off. Well, maybe this entire thing is just an allegory of the wealthy versus the destitute. Yeah, I, you're giving Arl Stein a little too much credit now. Allegory doesn't seem to be what he's going for here. Were you scared while reading it? No, I was not scared at all at any point. It was, it was a little bit suspenseful towards the end where, where everything was building up to um, sort of like a crescendo at the school dance. Everything came to a head. I was really into it. And then the only problem at that point was... And again, it wasn't scary, but it was suspenseful. It was thrilling. The ending was bungled a little bit. It, oh, I hated the ending. It was it was kind of like rushed and slapped together sloppily. Right up until the school dance and through the school dance sequence, it was going really strong for me. I thought it was doing really good. After that, you know, they go back home and Lisa's like, why don't you just call the cops? And he's like, no, I can solve this myself. It stumbles because he goes to the house and no one's there and he doesn't know what to do. And then he goes back home again and it's just like... And and then he goes back again again and then he gets in this big fight with Willa's brother and it's like why is Brad even fighting him at this point just explain what's going on it doesn't make any sense and then at the end they finally the big reveal in the last like three pages of the book Willa goes insane takes out a knife and tries to kill him it was him. a letter opener it was a letter opener but you know it was like one of those knife letter openers you could seriously stab somebody in death with one of those he uses his gymnastic skills to escape certain death he uses his gymnastic skills to escape certain 
and death a few times in the book. Oh, yeah. No, it's cool. You know what? It's great that even though he lost focus during the competition, he was able to regain it enough to, like, not die twice. Well, that actually goes back to the Joe Hill thing where, remember when Harper had to do something and she was, like, totally badass and did it, but she had, like, no experience and there was nothing saying, like, hey, she was interested in this. Well, this book beats you over the head with, he is a great gymnast. He is a great gymnast. Watch for his gymnastic skill. And we got it. Yeah. Several times. Exactly. Yeah. Joe Hill, take notes. Okay, go back. Read some R.L. Stein. Go go back to the basics. <laughs> Maybe he should read his dad. Yeah. <laughs> no, but this is like, this is really simple stuff that you can set up where I read that scene and I'm cheering for the guy instead of in the back of my head questioning what he's doing. I- I'm not questioning what he's doing because it's already been set up. That's out of the way. I'm cheering for him. I'm saying like, yeah, you do this, man. You fight for your life. You don't get stabbed. Yeah. All right. And then that final scene, despite how the last two chapters leading up to it were completely bungled, was very intense. It was well written. I was in the moment. It was like touch and go there. You didn't know if Corey was going to make it out. He was about to pass out. He's about to get choked out. He escapes out of that situation. He thinks he's safe. And all of a sudden... Also, why is Brad choking him to, like, the point of suffocation? I have no idea. Instead of, like, explaining it while They're on the same side here. It's very puzzling. It's insane. But I think he was trying to protect Willa at that point. But once Willa went completely full psycho killer, there was no way he could have protected her without getting rid of Corey for her. Because Corey was gonna basically... Corey was gonna call the police anyway. And at that point, it was either he was gonna go down with Willa or he was gonna side with Corey and just get Willa the help she needed. Because he wanted to get rid of Corey and he wanted to, like, he, I think he was trying to help Willa on his own, find some way to help her. He didn't think it was that bad. But once Willa shows all her cards, takes out a knife and tries to kill Corey and like goes totally psycho, there's nothing Brad can do at that point. He can no longer side with Willa and he can all he can do now is help Corey at this point. That's what happened. Okay, maybe it kind of makes sense now that, that he was choking out Corey. I didn't really yeah. read it like that. I just explained it to myself, so I'm satisfied now. But I, at the I time like when I was reading it, I agree with you. I didn't see it that way and it, it seemed I confusing. I still don't see it that way. I'm sorry. Okay. I enjoyed the book in a sense. I don't think you need to like characters or relate to them to enjoy a book. So in that sense, I was okay with the characters the way they were. I just felt like they weren't very well developed, so I couldn't really care about them. Right. I mean, the guy likes gymnastics. I don't know anything else about him aside from the fact that he's lusting after this girl he knows nothing about. Right. And that's all you know about him. And that is the most developed character in the entire book. Yeah, but you know, those are all normal things for teenagers. You you do lust after girls you know nothing about um that happens growing up and so that that was relatable and the other thing was relatable to me was the, the whole girl next door thing that's that's a great plot point well actually i hated that plot point i hated the ending of the book because it ends up with them as a couple where the entire book he is oblivious to everything in the end after it turns out that anna is actually psycho willa he goes hey lisa's available and she likes me and they kiss right. and i find that really weird well yeah so that gets into Corey's character where he's kind of a slut where he he makes out with Willa, who he thinks is Anna, and he really likes that. But then later on, he's hanging out with Lisa after she asks him out to the dance and he says yes. And she kisses him and he's okay with that. But then later on, he hangs out with Willa again. He kisses her and, and he's cool with that. But then later on, calls the cops on her and gets her arrested. And then he's making out with Lisa again. And... None of this seems to phase him. It doesn't seem to bother him a lot. Yeah, nothing seemed to really... Um, I don't know. I don't. So that's kind of... That's a little bit slutty of him, I guess. But going back to the whole childhood friend girl next door thing i found that to be like a a big thing that was that was a plus for me for this book i really liked that storyline it was nice it was just a really comfortable place to go to in the book while you're reading it like oh you know at least he has this i was rooting for that relationship i wanted it to happen because it just it just seemed like the nice thing and the parents were rooting for it too something about it's just i don't think the characters were developed enough for me to cheer for it right I didn't really... Even that Taylor Swift's music video for that song about, like, the girl next door, Mm -hmm. I felt had better character development and had me cheering for that couple more than this book. You know what? Because the thing is, they didn't need the character development for it to feel natural because every time they were together, they... He would talk about Anna and how much he loved her and how, like, he was into her. That's not really going to make me cheer for a couple. Okay, there was that. But I also felt that they really clicked. They were very natural together. There's no awkwardness between the two of them. Um, I think there was a ton of awkwardness because he did not notice that he really liked him. So she got more and more frustrated that's, during every interaction. That's the awkwardness of... I mean, she kicked him out of the house at one point. That's the awkwardness of being a teenager. But aside from just the awkwardness of being a teenager, my opinion is that they really clicked. They felt very comfortable together. You know, he was always coming over to her house just to chill out or whatever, just to like I think he viewed her as a bro more than anything. 
Yeah, and that was like, and what's wrong with that? There's nothing wrong with viewing her as a bro. It's the weird relationship where they had like a close friendship to relationship, but they didn't have the bridge that brought you over to that. I never felt it. I felt it that she wanted it, but I never felt that he wanted it or was interested in it. And all of a sudden it just happens. And I'm not entirely sure where that jetpack to relationship happened. You were going back to the place where you said their characters weren't developed enough to make the relationship believable. And I'm telling you that they don't have to be developed because... The fact that you see them as having a quote-unquote bro friendship shows that they're already compatible as people. They already I feel... I didn't know that they I'm already... not allowed to have an opinion on this. Like, I, I see where you're saying, but I don't agree. Okay, fine. Well, I mean, I'm just stating my own opinion. I just didn't feel the characters enough to believe the relationships. Right. I mean, I feel like the David and Corey relationship was better written because it was more a two-way street, whereas the Lisa-Corey one was a one-way street. And I don't really like that that ended in a relationship. You know what? Two-way street. Corey goes downstairs and his parents and Lisa's parents are playing Scrabble. And he asks what Lisa's doing that night. And they say, oh, she couldn't get a date, so she's at home. His first thought is, oh you know what i don't think she's feeling down because she couldn't get a date i think she's feeling down because they never have any food i'm gonna bring some snacks for her that'll cheer her up he grabs a bag of chips and a box of cookies and brings it over and her first reaction is like wow i was starving thanks for bringing these he knows her it is a two-way street he knows exactly what's gonna cheer her up she wouldn't be sad and alone if he had caught the hints of her they were walking home and she kept asking so what are you doing saturday he kept going Anna's amazing let's talk about Anna and she would go but Saturday night what are your plans and he would go Anna what about her yeah that was that was a frustrating scene so you know she said because of him he doesn't get to be the knight in shining arm I mean he was so oblivious to her feelings as he always is always no okay Hold on. Okay, so from... You got to be a little bit more fair to Corey because you don't know that he's always oblivious to her feelings. Right now, he is madly in in love with Anna and that is completely distracting him. The point where he can't even focus on his gymnastics routine. His gymnastics routine by the way, is described as something that he doesn't even have to think about. It's all muscle memory. All he has to do is stop thinking about anything and just go on autopilot and it's fine. And he can't even get that. He can't even get the first two moves of that. Multiple competitions, can't focus on his schoolwork. His relationship, not only with Lisa, but with Brad and with Arnie is suffering. So to say that he always ignores her is not fair. We only see Corey since his love at first sight incident with Anna. You don't see what he was like before that. But we aren't giving en- given enough of his character to make any judgment about him as a friend. I can't make that judgment that you just made because I don't have enough information about him. No, you're making a judgment. You're judging him based on these actions I'm... and saying he must have been this bad the entire because time. Because that's the only evidence I'm given. I just don't think that he was a good person to her. There was nothing that made me think they belong together, that this is going to be an inevitable couple. Because I do think it was a one-way street for the entire book that I read. Right. That he did not put any effort in that relationship. That's what effort did he put aside from agreeing to go to a dance because he thought that Anna wasn't going to be in school anymore and the moment he saw Anna he was like oh forget about Lisa and then the one good thing he did as a friend was when Lisa asked or when Willa asked him to the dance and no 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 I already agreed to go with Lisa that was like the one good thing he did yeah and that was a good thing that shows that you know he's a good person he goes to the dance with her Right, that shows that he's a good person that keeps his word, but that doesn't mean I see a two-way street there. I still don't see the foundation of a relationship. Like, they were friends, okay? She wanted it more than he did. He never really wanted it the entire book. You know, a book doesn't have to spell everything out for you. Do you want, want, like, a 400-page tome that shows their entire childhood growing up together? No. Because we're introduced during this very specific... You're not hearing what I'm saying. What I'm saying is, in this book, there were no moments where he was shown as a friend that he showed any interest in being anything more than her friend. Whereas the entire time, she is chasing after him, asking him if he's going to do something on Saturday, if he's willing to go out with her on Saturday, if she wants to go to the dance, telling him that she likes him. Well, he didn't see her that way because she's been his childhood friend since forever. Right, so what was the moment that changed everything except the fact that Willow was a crazy psychopathic murderer? There was nothing that changed except the girl that he lusted after was actually a psychopath, and then he decided to go with the girl next door. That's not true. Because, you know, what brings people together is going through a traumatic experience. They didn't go through the traumatic experience together. If she, if Lisa was in the house with Brad, Corey, and Lisa, or and uh, Willa, that would be a different story. They had that incident after the dance where right. she got pushed down the stairs 
And then they had to track down Brad and then... But his intent was They got wasn't... locked in a room together. I mean, there's a whole thing that went through there. But his intent wasn't for Lisa. It was for Willa. You have to look at the intent of the thing. The experience was him thinking, I need to get to Willa. I need to help Willa. I need to... Well, Anna at the time. I need to do this for Anna. At no point was this a... Lisa and I went through this. It was a, oh my god, Anna situation. Um, that's not how I read it. That's how I read it. Okay. I didn't see it as a uh, formative thing for their relationship. I didn't see anything that made their relationship plausible. Aside from the fact that she liked him and he wanted some. This is not a Cory Topanga love story, okay? That they were friends through childhood or whatever. This was just a girl next door is interested in me. Girl I like is crazy. Better go with the girl that's wanting me. That's all. That's all I read. You know, with with like 160 pages that R.L. Stein had here, he's not going to be able to give you like all the backstory. Of I already said I don't need the backstory. Story. I just need one incident in the book that shows him as seeing. It was the dance. And he goes after her and makes sure she's okay. And he like he didn't go after her. And he to tells make sure all the lookers was... on to like he heard her voice. He knew it was her scream because he could tell. By the way, how many people do you know where you hear a scream and you know that's their scream? A lot, actually. And so he ran to help. He was the first one there, and he dispatched all the gawkers and lookers on and said like, "Get out of here! Nothing happened." He like made sure she was okay and he protected her. You know, he was really there for her. He heard her scream. He went to help her. I mean, if he heard David or Arnie scream, he'd be there too. But he's not in a relationship with them in the end of the book. I mean, the relationship's implied. Going by what you're going on, if I'm okay with their, like, deep friendship and compatibility being implied, you should be okay with, like, you know, whether or not it's implied that they're actually dating. But they have more scenes. He has more scenes with David as a two-way street where he chats with David and they have fun together and David, you know, calls him to make sure he's okay. With Lisa, Lisa is constantly pining over him. Constantly. He's always coming over to her house for support. He's coming over to her house to talk about Anna. And he knows that Lisa knows Anna is real. And that Lisa has information about Anna. And he also wants to like just chat about Anna with someone that's not going to make fun of him. In the way that David or Arnie would. Where they keep talking about, oh who's that blonde chick that's on your mind? Have you banged her? Oh tell us more. He didn't want that. He just wanted like a friend to say, hey there's this girl. Let's talk about this girl and she doesn't want any of that. We have spent like half an hour arguing about this stupid relationship. Yeah, well, obviously we see this relationship differently. I think that this is a great relationship. They're going to work out for each other. Um, they both hate Star Trek and she hates cats and he's a jock. And so, you know, they're going to go great together. I and... don't see that. Okay, that's fine. I mean, I don't know how other podcasts disagree on things without completely like ending the entire podcast and just like blowing up all their accounts but if you guys have any suggestions and how to deal with this uh please comment well, a below. lot of this is gonna be cut okay. so much of this will be cut well i fucking hope so <laughs> i don't know why we got in an argument over this relationship all i wanted to do was like comment on the girl next door trope and move on to the ending and you just like latched I... onto me with claws of doom i think the last paragraph is stupid when it comes to girlfriends you sure know how to pick them she said he sighed yeah maybe from now on i should let you pick them for me her hand went up to his face she rubbed the back of her hand tenderly over his cheek maybe i should she said softly he turned and looked at her Got anyone in mind? Their faces were inches apart. She moved forward to fill in the inches. She kissed him a long kiss. A sweet kiss. Maybe, she said. Let's not. As a relationship that lasts a month. Um, so this ties into how, like, this book is very sexy. And there's a <laughs> lot of very voluptuous kissing scenes. There are a lot of kissing whether scenes. Whether imagined or real. So this is definitely not for the younger audience. This is more aimed towards like the high school kids that are maybe in like remedial reading class and can't it's... handle some of the tougher books. This is for middle schoolers. I'd say high like 7th grade, 8th grade. Yeah. It's probably when I would start reading this book. Because so... Goosebumps is a reading level 4 I think. So you start reading it in maybe 2nd or 3rd grade to 5th grade, 6th grade and then from then you would start in the Fear Street books. Would I? So probably 7th grade, 8th grade. Basically wraps up everything I wanted to talk about with the book. Can we talk about how they're not compatible as a couple? <laughs> yeah, let's never talk about the new girl ever again. Okay, thank you for listening to the second episode of Red Reads. I enjoyed reading The New Girl by R.L. Stein. The surprise party will be the subject of our next episode. Thanks for listening to another thrilling episode of Rhett Read Podcast. If you like what you hear, give us a shout out. If not, let us know why in the comments. 
Don't forget to rate, review, comment, share, like, and subscribe. You can follow us at Red Read Podcast on Twitter and Facebook. Or send suggestions or fan mail to red.read.podcast at gmail.com. Until next time, peace!